Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Dan Kirshner. I guess I, I've been talking for the last two minutes and I've been on mute. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. Uh, we're grateful you're here. I'm sorry I'm a little bit late. I was just a guest speaker at a webinar just immediately prior to this. I think we're probably seeing some folks from Northwest Natural start to join our webinar here. Yes. Uh, we're, we're really excited about this uh, webinar this week, Affordable Housing in the Pacific Northwest and, and Energy Policy Affecting It. We greatly appreciate uh, Mark Long, CEO of the Oregon Home Builders Association, and Josie Cummings, Assistant Director of Government Affairs for uh, the Building Industry Association of Washington. For me, it's easier to see, say BIAW. Um, but thank you, Mark and Josie, for being here today uh, and joining us. These uh, two uh, great speakers uh, have a lot of perspective and a lot of information about this issue. Their stakeholders, home builders, care about affordable housing. They care about uh, about ensuring that they can build houses that uh, people can actually get into, buy and get into. Uh, and they have some perspectives on energy policies in our region that are affecting uh, their ability to do that. So um, I don't know, Judy, can, yeah, you can move on. Thank you. Um, so notes for today, uh, we have you all muted. Uh, please remain muted and you know the chat function down there, you know how to use it. Uh, most of you have been on our webinars before, I think. So make sure you use that chat function. Mark and Josie, I'll just interrupt you as chats come in, as questions come in, if that's okay. Uh, and, uh, and we'll go uh, in, that, in that measure. Uh, I think our presenters have, uh, have made We'll make their presentations available after the webinar. In addition, we're recording this webinar. It will be up on our YouTube channel sometime probably later today or maybe early tomorrow. Uh, we also encourage you to think about joining us for our upcoming webinars, October 20th, featuring Onboard Dynamics, uh, which is serving the industry by helping it reduce methane emissions through its natural gas compression technology. There are a variety of applications of onboard dynamics uh, compression technology, which uh, are important both for consumers of gas and also for utilities. So we hope you'll join us on October 20th. And then in November 17th, we're gonna get an update from the founder and CEO of the RNG Coalition, uh, Johannes Escudero, on the status of the renewable natural gas uh, industry. Uh, so much has happened in really just the last two years in that in that world. Uh, we had them, I think, in early 2021, uh, but but so much has matured even in that short period of time that we've asked them to come back. And Johannes has graciously agreed to join us. So hope you'll make uh, you'll join us for those uh, those presentations as well. And I think Judy is getting ready to share screens. And uh, with that, Mark and Josie, I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to visit with you ahead of time. I, uh, I don't know which one of you would like to go first. Uh, it's, it's your call. Uh, well, why don't we go ahead and go with you, Mark? Okay. So are we ready for me to share the screen then? I believe so. Okay, give me just a sec here. There it is. There it is. Okay, great. Um, so again, uh, thanks, Dan, for the opportunity to uh, speak to your group. And I'm going to go through kind of a, if you will, a high level housing economy in Oregon overview, and then we'll drill into the into the building code side as, as we get towards the end. Um, I think the best place is to get a sense of the, here in Oregon, at least, the executive order that has set the stage for, uh, regrettably, for, for much of the work that, that's occurred here lately. And it, it's got, you know, more legs of the stool than what I've shown here, but they're really kind of four key legs to just kind of set the stage. Uh, the climate protection is the program under the Department of Environmental Quality that looks to um, candidly disincentivize fuels and gas and raise the price. And I'm sure you're all aware of that. But I think the important piece and the reason why I share this slide is, is, um, that area of the governor's executive order has, uh, there are briefs been filed and there is uh, pending litigation occurring in that area. Um, 
The second leg is land use and what we call here in Oregon climate friendly and equitable communities rules, 150 pages of changes to Oregon's land use system conducted during the pandemic through kind of a, a closed Zoom process that was fairly robust and that's likely to get litigated as well. There's a series of uh, business groups that are concerned about it that we're part of as well as uh, local governments. And um, um, although those pleadings haven't occurred yet, I expect that over the next few weeks. And then there's a range of things that impact the building codes, the built environment um, directions to the building codes agency and their boards from the governor's office. Uh, no litigation that we're aware of there. And then there were some things around OSHA uh, as relates to our industry heat and smoke rules, which in themselves are not that um, not that problematic, but OSHA did get in our view over their skis and get into um, labor standards, uh, new additional breaks and paid 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 leave time uh, as it relates to these rules. And so that that issue is being litigated and uh, filings have been made in federal court. So you have you have the governor's executive order that's that um, uh, impacts uh, the development community quite significantly in these again four kind of key bucket areas, and it's likely through uh, through the course of this, depending on how things go with the building codes piece, that all four will be uh, uh, challenged in court, and where many of us are asking for someone else to look at the governor's authority and some of the outcomes that come out of that. Before I move on to the to the next piece, talking about housing supply, just to just to, and I know we're really more on the regulatory side, but just to kind of give you a sense of what the problem is with the land use rules as it relates to development. It's not just residential, it's commercial development as well as residential. And the, the goal of these rules uh, purportedly was to reduce vehicle miles traveled through land use decisions and really disincentivize businesses at the commercial level. And then of course, housing that rely on vehicles for that business to survive. So grocery stores, drive through restaurants, large box stores, um, all those kinds of things are impacted as well as housing uh, where they want us in certain areas of, of the state to move to, uh, I believe, 24 units per acre uh, on the housing side, which pretty much eliminates single family dwelling within the urban areas and forces more of a multifamily approach. So pretty significant for those that kind of care about community development uh, commercial activity, uh, travel, um, use of vehicles to support business functions, trade, distribution, and then for us, obviously, on the housing side, because it will reduce opportunities for single family dwellings in, in many of our communities if those rules are, are uh, able to survive the ultimate challenge. Additionally, it's incredibly frustrating because Oregon is in a housing crisis, and the, you can see on the screen we rank second worst in the nation in terms of housing under production. That means that since the uh, Great Recession, we have not been producing at the level to meet population growth, um, about 110,000 units down. And we need to produce, as you can see, 30 to 40,000 units per year. And we're roughly at 20, I think we're at 18 and a half um, last year, and we're close to 20 the year before. So uh, this is very challenging to kind of meet our housing supply need which gets into cost components and all that. We are one of the most expensive places in terms of housing affordability in the country. Most of our home buyers are cost burdened, so they're not within that typical 28 to 32% of um, cost of housing as it relates to income. So they're upside down or forced into rent. And, and that actually occurs on the rental side as well as the home ownership side. So. We're not meeting the uh, desired outcomes of the state and wh while we're adding these regulations, these additional costs and limitations. So you'll get a sense of frustration in my voice as we uh, work through these, these issues. One thing that um, you might find interesting, this data comes from our national association that for every thousand dollars of regulatory cost or increase in price, we apply to housing, whether that's through a building code or a land use or an OSHA code or, any of the entitlement side, you lose about 1,500, I think it's 1,578 um, households in Oregon's qualifying under, and this was done before the mortgage rates uh, leaked up to close to five to 6%. This was done when they were a little bit more attractive. So I suspect that number is going to go up when we, when we recast the numbers. But you take about 1,500 folks uh, out of qualifying for homes at the 
at the at the levels of of um, income that we have here for average price homes to stay in that 28 to 32 percent so either they're moving into a rental product or they're coming into houses and getting upside down or leaving the area um, which we're seeing some as well so um, um, you know regulatory costs are a big piece and just just so the group knows kind of housing policy here in Oregon um, the cost of housing is typically driven by two government policies. We regulate the land supply, and then we uh, we uh, assign quite a bit of regulatory cost here in Oregon to housing. The typical labor materials supply, those kinds of things, that's pretty much the same regionally, and there's just not a lot the state government, at least, and local government can do to change that bucket. But on the land supply side or on the regulatory side, which is what we're here to talk about, um, fairly significant drivers in the price of the home. You can see this data is from our National Association. It's about 95K per new home on average, and it's, it's bumped up. Um, uh, more importantly, I think that number is a little high here for Oregon on average, just so that you know, but I think it tells the story. Um, and I mentioned that we're underproducing. We need to produce about 600, 580,000 units by 2040 to meet the demand and, and uh, um, uh, address the backlog. And most of that need or a significant portion of that need is in what we call workforce housing uh, available to folks in the 80 to 120 percent MFI range for a particular area. We're just not building market rate workforce housing for folks because of these limitations in land use policy, as well as uh, regulatory costs. The math doesn't work. I've just, uh, our national group puts together kind of their uh, cost drivers that relate to uh, the number that gets up around 90K, and you can see it's all inclusive. So we look at some of the hard costs as well as the land acquisition costs, as well as the building code costs, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, as well as um, uh, some of the design OSHA regulations. All of it kind of mixes together and is, is the cost driver. Now, this is the national perspective here in Oregon because infrastructure is paid through by system development charges, and I believe it is in Washington as well. Um, that is a big driver of anywhere twenty to fifty thousand dollars per housing unit in Oregon, paying for those infrastructure costs through SDCs. And I think one of the key things to keep in mind from a consumer's perspective or an end user perspective is these hard costs that we identify um, then are multiplied when you put those costs or fold it into the price of a home and then add sales commissions and other types of fees on the on the on the upper end of the house. And then you you get a loan for 30 years, uh, this $90,000 is probably going to get close to doubled over the 30 year period. So it's really quite a large number and fairly shocking over the course of a consumer's initial purchasing as well as uh, ongoing ownership of the home. So, of course, the key takeaways are uh, reducing construction development costs. That's one of the pieces. And then, of course, making land more available. Um, here in Oregon, you can see that a lot of the households that we're, we're underproducing on are in that below 50%. And just for those that aren't working in the housing space, usually around 80% of MFI, medium family income for a particular area, usually below that is where you need significant government subsidy. And then those families qualify for government subsidy in order to afford housing. Once you get into about the 80 to 80 space, that's what we call kind of market rate and that first level is workforce. And that's where most of my members then build. We're, we're typically not on what we call the affordable side or the subsidized side. We're typically on the market side, wanting folks to qualify for the homes. And our biggest problem is workforce housing because of the math exercise of these high regulatory costs and high land acquisition costs here. Uh, we just cannot bring that product to market. And so it's a, it's a significant area I've actually got a typo here. It's close to 20% uh, falls within the 80 to 120 AMI range um, that we need to be building that have been underproducing as it relates to workforce housing, kind of a key area that's going to need some additional government help on slowing the cost of regulation or uh, opening up the land supply in order to uh, bring in workforce housing, which obviously is important to all businesses who want to have uh, workers employed and, and living in their area. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to push on here is there is no mechanism in Oregon to track statewide costs. So, you know, just in this last year, thinking back to last October, very robust building codes 
adopted as a result of that executive order by the state of Oregon, probably five to $10,000 of costs in those building codes, depending on the house and features. So that was last October. Uh, then this year, uh, new wildfire standards were put in place. And that's another uh, $8,200 for if it happens to be in that particular area of costs added. We had OSHA regulations added. I mentioned uh, wildfire and smoke as a result of the executive order. Only a couple thousand dollars, but you saw how that math impacts the ability for people to qualify. And then we have these land use changes that I talked about that aren't in place yet, but are going to have a significant cost. So just in this year, based on kind of our analysis here at the home builders, and I'm sure there's something we, we're missing because, again, there's not a mechanism to track and display these costs across the agencies. Um, you've added anywhere, you can do the math with me, ten dollars to $20,000 just this last year that you'll start seeing in the cost of construction as we're going forward, as well as, as uh, just the policy issues of trying to use the building code to disincentivize gas or to provide preference to certain types of of product types um, um, that ships is kind of a double-edged sword. It, it creates challenges for obviously your industry and our industry that's supportive of your industry and what consumers actually want in their communities, um, but it's also driving up the price. So kind of a double-edged sword there. And we would not only like to address the fundamental problems, but also have a mechanism to track and display cost. We asked for that in this last legislative session uh, earlier this year, and it was uh, not supported by the party in charge. Um, so that bill did fail. I anticipate uh, if things go well this November that we'll be back with that issue and give us a chance to, to uh, address the, the in, a, in a more robust way the cost side as well as the land supply side of housing as it relates to um, uh, what we're experiencing here in Oregon. So with that Dan, I don't know. I mean, I can, these are the end of my slides and kind of prepared remarks. I'm happy to do Q&A or turn it over to the next presenter and then we can kind of follow up or if there's other areas that you would like me to um, uh, uh, take a little bit deeper dive as it relates to some of the regulatory activity occurring here in Oregon. I have a couple, I have a couple of questions for you and I'll take this opportunity to remind our folks, uh, if you have questions for either of our presenters, uh, please enter them in the chat. Uh, I can do so right now if you've got questions for Mark while I ask a couple of questions. So Mark, what, what I'm hearing you say is we've added maybe 20 grand to the cost of a, of a building, of a, of a home. Just this last year, Dan. Just in the last year. And you're already, uh, you're already, so what does that do to the 10% that are, kind of in that affordable home, first family home. I mean, yeah. is that, does that get your stakeholders like all the way out of that space too? For the most part, and again, I have a typo on that. We'll get it corrected. And so that when you put the slides up, it's uh, it's 20% uh, on the um, fall within that uh, 80 to 20 AMI. So the way the math is working here in Oregon today because of the land acquisition or land supply costs and because of these regulatory costs that we're starting to realize is there are many communities that are not, uh, our builders can't provide this product in, in many of the primary communities. So that's your larger cities, Portland, Salem, Eugene, et cetera. There's some allowance in the secondary communities, your smaller towns where the local government would be willing to, to address some of those high regulatory costs. But just to kind of give you at, at a high level, we have to slow down the rate of, of, of adding regulations. And in order to kind of make up this number of units, it's about 100,000 units we need to do over the course of the next de uh, decade or so in this workforce housing space. Our builders believe we're going to have to see a reduction in cost or a significant increase in family income, which I'm not sure we're going to see. Uh, things are starting to flatten or go the other direction, I think, as you know, with the high cost of inflation. We need about twenty dollars to $50,000 to buy down that price for us to, um, to uh, for us to bring workforce housing, even into these secondary markets going forward. So you're going to see a further, um, you're going to see further underproduction in that area. And you're going to see uh, folks who then ultimately do qualify either being upside down in their housing prices or moving to more of a rental product. But our renters in Oregon are upside down as it relates to their cost burdening uh, 
basically wanting to spend about 30% of your income on, on shelter. Uh, we're, as I said earlier, ninth worst in the country in that area. And that applies on the rental side as well as the home ownership side. Hmm. So not good the, news, not good news. Right. Um, uh, yeah. Both for, for us who build homes and for families, but for employers, we have many areas right. of the state, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but many areas of the state where because we can't, we don't have housing for our workers, we can't expand our businesses or grow our businesses. It's a significant issue that's going to have to be addressed. And these cost drivers and these land, these land limitations are exacerbating the problem. Okay, the other question I have is, so you, you say you, you proposed a bill last session uh, to, to have a statewide mechanism to track display costs. Um, I, my presumption, well, I mean, what, why do you think it failed? So I, I can, I wasn't familiar with the legislation. I'm not familiar with the legislation, but clearly you want to track and display regulatory costs, uh, which are in the neighborhood of, I think you said a hundred thousand dollars. Those are just hard costs before you start building. Right. I mean, yeah, what, what we're wanting is, um, uh, agencies here in Oregon, I assume up in Washington and, and, and throughout the region agencies go into what you call rulemaking. You put together a rule advisory committee or whatever. And, and at the end of the day, they're supposed to identify the fiscal impact to the to business and to the citizens of their decisions. And there is a there is a housing cost impact mechanism here in Oregon, but it doesn't it doesn't really get at the issues of identifying today's types of products, what the costs are, and then there's no mechanism to cumulatively track it. Because so what I see occur in Oregon is we'll have a conversation, let's just say, on the building code side. Well, it's only a thousand dollars. What's the big deal? And this idea is only a thousand dollars. What's the big deal? And OSHA, it's only a couple thousand dollars at OSHA. What's the big deal? And over at the land use department, it's only five thousand dollars. What's the big deal? And over at uh, DEQ, it's only a couple thousand dollars. What's the big deal? Well, it's a big deal both at the thousand dollar level because you can see you're taking people out of qualifying for home ownership at the at the numbers that I indicated. But at a cumulative level, there's no mechanism for the state to see what it has done and to at least prioritize what it wants to work on, maybe impact the timing so that you don't impose all those costs in one short time frame that can be upsetting to the market and just drive people out of workforce housing, but just all housing across the board. I should probably mention to this group that not only are we um, concerned about the code changes that went into effect this last October, but the state has already gone into, because of the executive order, um, uh, co-change analysis to make changes next October um, that we believe will be even more expensive than this last cycle and more prohibitive um, and an attempt to, again, disincentivize um, certain utility sources, gas, um, and force a whole bunch of weatherization components on ours to get to this concept of, can't see my hands up in the air, but net zero home, um, uh, we see that coming forward. And, and we think that is that is going to be the big cost um, bucket of this kind of executive order that was put in place a few years ago. So it's actually, it's bad now. We think it's gonna get worse on the horizon if something's not done. So I do have a question in the chat and Josie, get ready. I think we're about ready to shift gears here. So maybe Mark, while I ask the question, you can stop sharing and we'll let, uh, let Josie start sharing. Uh, we have a question with the new and proposed regulations for type of appliances that can be used in a home or apartment complex. Is there gonna be an issue with enough energy at a development site, enough transmission or grid electricity? So as we electrify, yeah, absolutely. Well, your builders seeing seeing an issue with actually having access to the energy necessary for a development. Well, I think I think we're going to see it. I don't have the I don't have the data to back that up, but I think anecdotally that's obviously an issue. I um, mean, you know, our big problem right now is because of supply chain, we're having difficulty just getting temporary power and, and delays getting power just to our site. So it's slowing down construction, which as you know, all drives up the price because you're, you're, uh, you're paying interest on, on that, on that development and anything supply chain, labor, uh, regulatory delays, um, uh, changes in mortgage rates that uh, have homeowners um, 
uh, uh, concern. The wildfire regulations that were rolled out here in Oregon that had to be pulled back caused several sales to fail because it was kind of rolled out in a, uh, in a less than complete manner. I'm trying to be generous. Um, all those things are very disruptive in the market right now. Okay. Uh, I'll just direct people's attention to the chat function. Kevin Duell has a comment. Uh, reminds me of San Francisco. Workers have to live in Oakland or farther out and commute to the city. So uh, that's uh, certainly that that certainly doesn't help with our objective of reducing carbon emissions in that regard. But maybe, uh, well, okay, I, I'll avoid the the, the commentary. Uh, anyway, do do folks. Please keep an eye on the chat and please enter uh, questions in. Josie, we're so glad you could join us. Thank you for your time today and, and uh, the expertise that you're going to share with us. So the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you for having me today. Um, Josie Cummings, I'm with the Building Industry Association of Washington. Um, we um, represent uh, just over 8,000 members across the state engaged in every aspect of residential construction. So a lot of the things um, you're gonna hear today are similar to um, what's going on in Oregon. So I'll try to um, just kind of point out where we're similar and where maybe some things are, are different. Um, so a lot like Mark said, we've got an affordability problem here in Washington. Um, for the, com the current um, median sales price of all homes, so, New and existing um, is about 560,000. Um, that's up 24% from 2020. Um, and the current median price of a new home in Washington is 565,000 in 2022, which is up an additional 8.4%. Um, our numbers for 2022 from our national association is that 76% of households in Washington are priced out and cannot afford a mortgage on a new home. Um, and because the um, new home price and the median price of all homes are so similar, it's it's a pretty uh, accurate statement for just ex existing infrastructure as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and as we move to um, purely electrification, uh, that housing affordability crisis only only gets worse. Um, the estimate um, to electrify um, homes is an additional $14,500 um, to build homes um, with other energy sources. Um, the current energy code that we are building under in Washington added twenty dollars to $30,000 onto the cost of a new home, um, which is anywhere between sixty dollars and $90,000 over the lifetime of a 30-year mortgage. And so when you look at those increments and kind of what we're talking about pricing folks out that just gets worse and worse um, and especially as we're looking at those really aggressive um, code proposals at the state building code council um, if you're retrofitting gas to electric like some of the proposal we saw in bellingham um, last year that thankfully that um, did not make it in but they wanted before you were able to put your home on the market, you had to ret and then you had gas, you had to retrofit. Um, that was going to be an additional $29,000 before you could even um, sell. Um, it's, you know, it's just, frankly, it's, it's crazy. And the um, payback period for fully electric takes 44 to 60 years, you know, with gas, it's less than 10 years. People, you know, I know I'm, preaching to the choir, but people like energy choice and want to be able to cook with gas and, and have those energy choice options. Um, you know, tankless gas water heaters last about 20 years and what we're hearing heat pumps, water heaters only last about a decade or maybe a little bit longer. Um, and so all of those things really add up. They add up quick. And um, as we, um, move to certified net zero homes and um, requirements for solar as we move forward, um, you know, that adds significant cost as well. Um, for solar, it's a minimum of, you know, about around 50, $55,000, depending on kind of your climate zone where you're at in the state. Um, and, you know, it's not, um, 
fully reliable and without the government subsidies, it doesn't um, necessarily always uh, make cost a lot of cost sense. Um, in the 2022 legislative session, we saw several bills um, trying to attack natural gas and go fully electric. Um, you know, there were reach codes that would have added for around $40,000. Um, there was just an all-out ban on natural gas. Um, and then there was ones that targeted and electrified large commercial buildings. Um, hey, Josie, current... let, let me oh, interrupt okay. really quickly. A couple questions. One, um, uh, Ted McCammon is asking from Cascade Natural Gas if we can get access to the calculations for the numbers that I think it's mm -hmm. like a couple slides back. Uh, yes. You're referencing costs I for said... like uh, electrification. Electrify yes. an existing home. Yes. So we did a couple studies in house um, on just electrification based on climate, climate zones, and um, the the current energy codes. I am happy to provide those studies um, that we had Andrea Smith in our office do. Um, I can send those over to Dan and Judy, and then maybe get that'd, those out. That'd be great. The second question is: Will the new I'm not sure what Rusty's referring to here, but the new electrical regulations be enforced on remodeling homes and apartments. Um, uh, I think maybe you're talking about retrofitting. So right now there isn't any uh, regulation or rule that would require retrofitting. It's just something that we're hearing people talk about. I would say um, that the current, the commercial code that is under consideration and may be adopted Mm -hmm. requires um, heat in, in the case of a major retrofit, which is defined as, you know, if you're going to replace your heating equipment or anything like that, you would have to comply with the new code. And for the commercial code that's under consideration, that code uh, prohibits gas-fired space heat and gas-fired water heat in all commercial buildings. Uh, which includes apartments of four star stories or taller. I think that's right. Yes. Yes. All right. That code is not in effect yet. If it passes uh, and Josie and the NWGA and others are working overtime to try to make sure it doesn't, uh, but it's a steep hill to climb. I'll just leave that. If it passes, that code will go into effect July 1st of 2023. Um, absent any other intervention in the process, which we would expect there would be. So uh, anyway, that's, I, I hope we've answered Rusty's question. So go ahead, Josie, thanks. Perfect. Um, so as yeah. we're kind of talking about, um, you know, the commercial code, um, we've, we also, so luckily we were able to kind of slow things down the legislature this year, but the building code has taken things off and they are full speed ahead. Um, they passed the commercial code initially. Um, now they're working on the group two codes, which is the residential code. Um, you know, there's been a lot of interesting thing happening at the state building code council. There's 15 members. Um, BIW actually um, entered into a lawsuit earlier this year because there were um, uh, some members of the residential and commercial construction industry that were appointed illegally by the governor and um, we were successful in in getting our folks back on so that was a good win um, but however uh, governor Inslee has um, been actively in replacing um, in in replacing the council to kind of suit his um, environmental agenda for the energy codes particularly um, uh, two thirds of the council vote is needed to pass um, the energy code changes. That's the same um, for, um, I think this slide's maybe a little bit uh, old because it did pass um, in April, um, but now we're moved on to the, the residential energy code, which um, has a lot of this a similar um, code proposals. So Josie, um, I'll, just, I'll interject here very quickly. The, I think there is a question maybe you may have an answer to it and this is getting a little in the weeds for our crew but there seems to be a question about when the group one and group two codes are combined uh does the commer the requirement for a two-thirds vote on the commercial code 
is that activated because the commercial code is part of that process? So open question, uh, sure. not for an answer today, but uh, I think that seems to be maybe maybe there's something there. Sure. So I'll I'll give I'll give this answer. I'm not an attorney. Um, right. Our sure. interpretation in the office is that it would require a two thirds vote, and historically, I do think that's what it is. But I think there is some question at the code council themselves about how they go and and do this. So I think that question is still kind of up in the air and it'll be interesting to see how the code council council chooses to move forward with right. their voting. I think we're also hearing um, rumors that because there is so much going on in the codes and kind of the dysfunction of the process this year, that there might be a delay in the codes and voting on those. So we're not sure, but that's kind of what we are hearing and we'll find out, I think, on the 23rd. I see that, that the timeline for 2021 code implementation is on the agenda for this Friday's meeting, right? Yes. So that is what we are hearing is that because there hasn't been some studies that are required to be done, that maybe um, the way that they passed the code, there was some some uh, things that were passed as an appendix were accidentally entered into the code, so the code's regular body, and so that that might mess up how the code is formally adopted. I don't know. I think procedurally it's been kind of a little bit messy. And I know Dan, you've been involved with kind of the different stakeholders right. discussing that. Um, but I, I think they haven't voted on the group, the group two codes yet. Um, the proposal to require the new residential buildings to be all electric. Um, you know, they're the same proposals in the commercial energy code, the heat pump space heaters um, and the heat pump water heaters. Um, so we will see, I know that we're actively working to kind of count votes and see what we can do to, um, make sure that that doesn't pass. I, I, and a delay would be interesting because I'm not sure legally what that means because it has, codes have to sit through a full legislative session before they can be implemented. So if they are delayed too much and the legislative session begins, um, it would have to wait at least until the following legislative session. So. Um, I think there's still a lot up in the air when it comes to what's going to happen. I think if they if they do pass, I think there's some questions about um, legal avenues and looking at different op options. And um, let's see. Let me while you're while you're regathering. <laughs> sorry for interrupting, but I did have one question from Aubrey Newton. Are we able to get a copy of this presentation by chance? Yeah. I think both presenters have indicated they will make that their presentations are available. And Judy, with not my staff, will, uh, I think, send them out to um, participants. There's also a, a uh, there will be a recording of this on our YouTube channel afterwards. So you're able to share that with people who may be interested in the presentation as well. Thanks for the question, Aubrey. And Josie, thanks. Uh, yeah. Go. Yeah, definitely. We'll get this over and some of those reports over so you guys can have that. Um, no, we're really supportive and really thankful for the partnership with your guys' proposals for um, allowing natural gas as an energy efficient alternative. Um, you know, that provides a lot of relief for home builders and buyers. There's a lot of supply chain issues. Um, you know, it, it's also a great option to preserve energy preference for homeowners and energy choice. And um, the, you know, BIW's proposal to allow for more flexibility in the codes, um, it allow would allow builders of new construction to use um, simulated performance alternatives to demonstrate how a home meets or goes above and beyond um, different carbon uh, reduction standards and the energy kind of, uh, the energy credits and the energy rating index in the state's um, residential energy code as they kind of monkey with the credits um, in this code cycle. Um, you know, as we just look forward to what's going on and, and with interest rates and with supply chain and with other regulatory um, costs that are associated, it just um, it's really frustrating and it's something that we um, hear about from our members and from customers. And it's just, you know, people um, want to be able to have 
um, natural gas, it's a great option and it's something that we're working really hard to make sure that we can keep using. Because the bottom line is the State Building Fund Council is not balancing the cost of increasing energy efficiency with the need for affordable and attainable housing. Um, in Washington, we're about 250,000 units short um, across um, you know, every aspect of the housing ladder. And um, we just, we already are struggling to comply with the current code compliance mechanisms in the energy code. Um, you know, it makes it more stringent um, and there's delayed implementation um, of the 2018 codes. So there's just a, a lot going on and it doesn't seem responsible. It doesn't seem fiscally makes sense. And so there's just a lot going on when we talk about housing affordability and, and how we can work on that. And something that we say a lot in the office, um, you know, is and we talk to legislators and regular, um, the regulatory folks is how can we make housing more affordable when you're making it more expensive? And, um, you know, they don't, they don't think about those things. And so that's something that we're um, just trying to focus on and as we're moving forward and can, looking forward to continue to working with you guys. And if there's any other questions or things I can chat about, just let me know. Yeah, Josie, do you have another slide? Looks like there's one more there, maybe. Uh, it's just my final. Okay, great. Slide. Oh, it's just good to have your contact info. Um, I thought one of the things that Mark brought to the table, uh, and please, folks, uh, enter questions into the chat. I'll ask a couple questions uh, to to give you time to do so. Uh, but we really want to engage with our presenters today. <clears throat> so, Josie, Josie, Mark. Uh, provided some information about the actual hard costs of regulation in building a home. That so let's say an average new home is $565,000 or whatever the number was. Um, and it, you know, $100,000 of that cost are just baked in. Does, does BIAW have a similar calculation or was that derived nationally? Is there are there things you can do that demonstrate? Uh, I think that's a, to me, that's compelling information just to know what regulations are already adding to it. So just wondering if you have in, uh, similar information at yeah. the state level, not so much at the federal level. Which yes, I know so we do have a number um, that I do not have off the top of my head, but it's very similar to that. I think we use the same percentage. Um, that Oregon uses. Um, I, I think it's about 30% um, is about the cost of government regulation, um, if that is correct. It sounds like you're looking for that. So one, maybe a question for Mark and you. So did the, the numbers you put out there, Mark, which resulted to like around $95,000, I think you said. Um, is that regardless of house size? Is that just what it costs to actually, before you build a house, you've got to incur $100,000 in compliance costs in effect, right? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah Dan, so that's a national average based on average home size and, and markets and whatnot. And it, excuse me, it's all inclusive because if you, again, if you look at the uh, table, uh, or I can get it pulled back up, possibly, it, it lays down, you know, design costs, land acquisition costs, OSHA costs, and all those things. And so I think most builders, because that gets baked in over time, right. and they're kind of thinking about today would probably say it's a little bit, a little bit lower. Um, 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 I'm sorry, um, I just lost my train of thought here. Um, what was your question again? Sorry. Yeah, so is, is there a <laughs> That sort of regulatory compliance cost of X, 80,000, 60,000, whatever the number is, just to contemplate building a house. That's right. That's the hard cost. Um, I mean, in, in Oregon, that again, you can break the, the cost up into three buckets. And if you just think um, just super easy math, uh, you buy a lot for $150,000, which you probably can't find anywhere in Oregon, Washington very well. <laughs> Right. Um, let's say it has infrastructure on it, not a lot of um, other uh, regulatory environmental compliance problems. 
And then your, you know, your materials labor just cost of building a 1600 square foot home is going to be around $200,000. Again, you hate to throw that stuff out because with supply chain and materials and inflation, right. things are changing pretty radically, but, and then, so now you're up to 350, which, you know, I bought my first house at $54,000 a while back. It was a pretty nice house. It was in the nineties, but nevertheless, um, and then you add uh, 50 to $75,000 of regulatory costs. Now you're up at four and a quarter for what would be, you know, back in the day, uh, we don't build them like this anymore, but a, a ranch style house. Um, um, and that's, that's not affordable in many of the markets when you look at the average family income for the communities, Multnomah County, you know, our most populous has fairly high, I think it's around 90 K, but you can get in, into cities such as Gresham. I think it's around 60 there and uh, it, it can go south from that. And that's the real problem here in Oregon is when you add in that high land cost, which is regulated and controlled by the government because they control the supply right. and you add in the regulatory cost, um, it puts you out of reach for uh, that workforce or that starter home space that we're talking about. And that's one of the significant areas that's been underproduced and the hardest to crack on the market because those buyers don't qualify for government subsidies and the builders don't get any level of subsidy unless they can talk a local government into reducing their, their system development charges. Um, there are places where we don't build. We have, um, take up too much of your time, but we have a builder that actually just has a math formula and determines the average price of land in a particular community, the cost of, of the regulations that that community is, is adding to the pie, the average wage for that community. And then they'll sit down with that community leader and say, here's what I can bring to market or can't. And if the community leader is unwilling to um, modify those regulatory costs, they don't build the product and they move on to the other community. So you have communities that are, don't even have access to this workforce housing. <clears throat> Hmm. Um, well, I'll just you know, personal statement here. I'm I'm happy to pay for the land, and I'm happy to pay for the bricks and mortar, and the labor that puts it together. I'm even happy to pay for regulations that ensure the structure is safe and sound uh, that I'm buying. But then beyond that, uh, I'm going to start having questions. Right? That's me. Um, so Janelle, Janelle Guthrie. Thanks, Janelle, for putting this in the chat. Uh, she says that uh, generally regulation at all levels, city through federal, accounts for about 25% of the final sales price of a new home in Washington. Is that regardless of size, Janelle? So, uh, you know, whether it's a 1500 square foot house or a, I know there's land regulation issues like Mark referred to, but in generally speaking, is that a good rule of thumb, 25%? Yes, that's the general kind of rule of thumb. Okay. But I do think a kind of our standard is around, I think the standard house, I think is around 2000 square foot is kind of what they base that off of. Okay. Do we have any other questions for either of our presenters? Uh, again, I'll give you just 30 seconds or so to, to think about that. Do look in the chat. There's a video. Um, Josie, do you know how long this video is that Janelle posted? It's pretty short. It's just a couple minutes. Um, well, I encourage you to go to the uh, go to the chat. Look at that video. It talks about the the actual regulatory number or regulation cost number for Washington is in that video. So, uh, and that will bring you to other resources that the BIAW has. Again, I encourage you to look to our presenters, their organizations, the Oregon Home Builders Association and Build <coughs> Building Industry Association of Washington have. A lot of terrific. Why should you click below and take Soljan's solar quiz? Sorry, Great question. Sorry. Um, anyway, uh, I think uh, so. Uh, Janelle put another link in there cutthecosts.org. Cutthecosts.org is uh, a website that BIAW has put together that has lots of this information and good resources for those of you that want it and or want to equip your coworkers, colleagues, friends and neighbors with uh, information to to advocate for affordable housing in Oregon and Washington. So uh, once again, we appreciate your time uh, today, Mark and Josie, very grateful for your expertise and sharing it with us. Uh, the resources that both of these organizations have are terrific in this regard. Affordable housing is <clears throat> homelessness is 
the big issue directly related to affordable housing, I would say, uh, 